Right. Oh, that's too loud. How does that work? Okay. Uh, happy Wednesday. Is it Wednesday? Yeah. Yes. Yeah. Woo. So you know the coffee myth, right? Some of you I heard, overheard talking about that. So how they decided to, uh, to eat coffee is these like goat herders saw goats eating coffee beans and then like jumping around like crazy. <laughs> so then they thought, let's do that. And then that's how they started drinking coffee. That's the myth. <laughs> I don't know if it's true or not, but it works. No, I don't know if it's true. How do you know that it's true or not? Cool. All right, let's get started. So we're going to close out the type section today. Uh, so we're going to close out, well, at least this part of types. Uh, we're going to go through the structural equivalence algorithm example, and then we're going to do Hindley Milner type inference. Which I think we could probably get through today. We'll see how that goes. That'll be cool. Um, and then homework six was sent out right before class. And the solution to homework five was also released. And so on Friday, we'll do just like before, we'll do practice midterms uh, released on Friday. And they'll go through that in discussion sections to get you all ready for the midterm next week. Cool. Any questions on that stuff? Yeah. Monday. There's only one problem. Okay. What? Homework six is due on Monday. It's one question. Is it a fit question? Mm -hmm. Is it just like a fit question? I, you'll see when you see it. It's doable by Monday. Anything else? Cool. All right. Let's get to the structural book. Oh, sorry, you guys can't see anything different. It turned into presenter mode, so weird. I hit the wrong buttons. Okay, cool. So, structural equivalence. What does structural equivalence mean? Yes, what does that mean, though? How are we using this? What was that? Yeah, so we have a type system, right? And we want to tell if we have a variable assigned to another variable, is that allowed by our type system, right? Does the type system actually express and allow this operation, right? When we see x equals y, we know the type of x and we know the type of y. Now we need to understand, are those types equivalent? If those types are equivalent, then we can allow that operation. Cool. So structural equivalence, unlike name equivalence, which just says everything for two types to be equivalent, they must have the exact same name. That is it. Boom. Right? Internal name equivalence is slightly different. And structural equivalence says, well, are they basically the same object or the same data types underneath? Right? So their names really have no meaning at all. And we're just trying to determine based on the structure of the types. So we talked about cyclical definitions, right? We want to see if a structure contains a pointer to another structure. And that pointer contains a structure to the first structure, a pointer to the first structure. Are those things structurally equivalent, right? And so to get around that, we're going to start with all entries in our table. So we're going to have a table with all the types on the rows and columns of each. Yes, every type in our program will be along the rows and the columns, as we'll see. And we're going to initialize all entries to true. So you can think of it this way. We're assuming that all types are structurally equivalent. Then we're going to go through each element in this table and say, is it true? Can we try to disprove that? Are these types not structurally equivalent? And just like first and follow sets, whenever we have to look up, well, these two types will be equivalent if, like type A and B will be equivalent if type C and D are the same. To answer that question, we look it up in the table, right? We don't do any kind of recursive nonsense. Well, not nonsense, but cool. So we assume, so we're going to assume that all types are structurally equivalent unless we have proof otherwise. And so the algorithm is simple. N by N table, each entry in that table is defaulted to true when we start. Then we have a while loop. While this table has not changed, check each entry in the table, IJ, if type I and type J are not structurally equivalent by the rules that we set out then set the entry ij in the table to false. That's it. Cool. 
So we can do this. We'll go through, we'll walk through a simple example, and you'll be doing, your homework is doing more of this, determining structural equivalence and the other types of type equivalents that we talked about. So type T1 is a structure. Its first field, which name is A, is an integer. The second field, P, is a pointer to some structure T2. T2 is a structure. That's first field is an int of name C. Its second field is Q, which is a pointer to T3. Yes? Filling out the table, that end by end table, is that part of static analysis? Like, can we do that before we even start compiling? We just kind of. Yes, we do that by looking at the definitions of the types. That allows you to create this table. You actually, because you think about it, what you're talking about now is you're talking about. Um, figuring out if two types are equivalent. You don't care if they ever say, does structure T1 equal structure T2, right? You don't actually care about any of the variables. You just want to know, for later reference, which ones are structurally equivalent. Cool. So we have T3, where A, the first field, is a float. The second field, P, is a pointer to T1. Straightforward? So this is why we need an algorithm, right? Because we can look at this, and it's kind of difficult to say just offhand which things are or are not structurally equivalent, right? I mean, it can be kind of straightforward. As you get more and more types, it becomes more and more difficult. Cool. OK, so in our table, we have three types. So we're going to have T1, T2, T3, and T1, T2, T3 as the columns and the rows. Cool. And we're going to start with the start of our algorithm, right? We're going to initialize everything to true. Right? Done. Boom. Are we done? So let's think about the properties of this table. Is the diagonal of this table ever going to change? Or I guess one of the diagonals. Well, is it, is this one? I don't think it's considered diagonal, so we'll go with this diagonal. No. Why not? This is, this is <coughs> yeah, everything is going to be structurally equivalent to itself, right? That should never change, right? That's something we can guarantee right now. A type is always structurally equivalent to itself, right? Cool. Now, if I change, let's say, not even looking at this, let's say I change T3 is not structurally equivalent to T1. Let's say I change that to false. Should I update the, ta the table at all? So if I know that T3 and T1 are not structurally equivalent, does that tell me anything else about this table? Just looking at the table, not even looking at the types. T3 and T1 are not equivalent. Yeah, so if T3 and T1 are not structurally equivalent, I also know T1 and T3 are not structurally equivalent, right? Cool, so I can use that knowledge actually while I'm making this table and not go through every single element. Right? I can go through all of the elements in one upper half or bottom half of this table. Cool. Okay. So we're first going to look here. T1, T2. T1, T1. We already said these are always going to be structurally equivalent. Cool. Is T1 and T2 structurally equivalent? So how do you tell? Mechanically. You're the computer. How do you tell? Check the types. They're both structures. That's the first thing. If they were not structures, you could immediately say not structurally equivalent. If one's a structure and one's a pointer, you can say immediately not structurally equivalent. Okay, they're both structures. So what does the rules tell us? How do we know if two structures are structurally equivalent? Their members are of the same type. If their members are of the same type. So what specifically is important about the members? The sequence, the order, right? So the first field here is an int. The first field here is an int. Is that structurally equivalent? Yes. Yes. That's by our first rule on structural equivalence, right? Two basic types are structurally equivalent. Like, sorry. The same basic type is structurally equivalent to itself, right? Ints are structurally equivalent to ints. Cool. Then we have to look at the other field. So is a pointer to T2 structurally equivalent to a pointer to T3? Yeah, so they're both pointers, right? That's yes. Pointers are equivalent if what they point to is structurally equivalent. 
right? So what they point to is, so the question is, is T2 and T3 structurally equivalent? Yes. Yes, based on our table, right? Just like first and follow sets, we use the table. We don't then go and try to calculate T2 and T3. We look at the table and we say the table says they are structurally equivalent, therefore I say they're structurally equivalent, so therefore do I think that T1 and T2 are structurally equivalent? Yes. Yes. Cool. Then I go into here, T1, T3. So are they at a high level, do they, are they at a high level structurally equivalent? Yes, they're both structures, right? So then two structures are structurally equivalent if each of their fields. So is an int structurally equivalent to a float? No. No. So we can change that to false. And we're also going to have to change that other entry in our table to false. Right? Do we need to keep checking the second field? No. No, we've already determined it's false. There's no possible way. It doesn't matter what is here. Right? As soon as we get that first inconsistency and say they're not structurally equivalent, we're done. Cool. Then we're going to check T2 and T3. So are T2 and T3 structurally equivalent? Well, we check their structures. We check their first field. We see that we have two ba different basic types. So we say they're not structurally equivalent. And we change to false. Update this other part in the table to false. Are we done? So we've gone through all the elements. Are we done? Is this it? No, we did one iteration of the table, right? Now we have to ask, did we make changes to the table? Yes. yes, so we have to do it again. So we say, are T1 and T2 structurally equivalent? Well, we check the first fields. Ints, are the ints structurally equivalent? Yes. The second field is pointers to T2 and pointers to T3. A pointer to T2 and a pointer to T3 will be structurally equivalent if T2 and T3 are structurally equivalent. Are they structurally equivalent? No. no. So this gets changed to false. And I would keep going through this again, but I've actually already said, so can this table change anymore? No. No, so this would be another way you know you're done, when no types are structurally equivalent to any other types. If not, if this was true, if T1, T2 was true, we would go through it one more time and make sure that nothing changed, and if nothing changed, then we would stop. Well, questions on this and this algorithm? Cool. Some tips to think about when you're doing this on an exam when time is limited. If you have a lot of types and you have some types that are pointers, some types that are structures, some types that are, I don't know, definitions of basic types or something, do you need to make a huge nine by nine table? Right, because you know that pointers are never going to be structurally equivalent to structures. So you can make separate tables just for the pointers and separate tables just for the structures. Right, so you can group them that way and think about c comparing them that way. You can still do it with the nine by nine, it'll work. Little helpful tip. Cool. That's types. You know everything you need to know about. All right. Now we get to super cool type systems. Oh no, it didn't work. Let's see if it works. Wow, this is amazing. This is a game changer. Cool. Okay. So we've been studying type systems for the last week plus something like that, a certain amount of time. And in every single one of these examples, right, the programmer must declare the types of all the variables, right? And is this true in your day-to-day -day programming life? Is it true in the projects that you write for this class? Yes. Yes, right? You have to declare that A is an array of 0 to 5 of ints. You have to declare that variable i is an integer. And then this way, so the question is why, right? If we go back to why, why do you have to declare the types? Well, it's because, so that that way, the compiler, when it sees a bracket i, what is it checking for here? 
What was it? Yeah, so what is the type system checking here? What is it? If this is a valid expression according to our type system or statement in our type system, what does that mean? What is it checking for? What was that? So, which int? The type of what variable? The index should be an int. Yes, so the index into an array must be an integer. Right? That's what it's checking. It's checking to make sure that this variable i is an integer. What else is it checking for? So that's one thing. What's another thing? Yes? It has to know how many offsets multiplied by the scalar i to jump to the size of those offsets. So in order to know the size of the offsets, it has to know the type, the base type of the array. Sure. So it needs to know the base type of the array so that when it computes uh, the i index into a, it knows how to actually compute the i index based on the size. So here it knows that the array is composed of ints, so the C code, when it spits out x86 assembly, knows exactly how many bytes to uh, do. What else? What else is this program? This, what else is happening here? So what yes. is being put into this array? How do we read the type of the integer as well? Right, so how do you add the type into the array? What if we tried to put a string here on the right-hand side? Would the type system allow us to do that? No. No, it shouldn't, because it knows that A is an array of integers. Therefore, if you try to, so an array of integers, if you apply the uh, array access operator, if you think about it type-wise, it's going to return whatever that type is. So here it's going to be an int. Right? So if I'm trying to assign to one of those elements in the array, I can only, the right-hand side better be an integer. Right? So we can see, even in a very simple case like this, there's complex things that are happening here. Right? So part of what we're going to be thinking about, and so the question is, right, so if we know if we declare a string i and we try to say ai equals 1, what's the compiler going to say? It's going to throw a type error and say you can't index into an array with a string in a C-like language. And could we do something like this? Change it back to int i? Do ai equals some string testing? No. No. And so this, here we can see, and we talked about this when we first talked about type systems. You are all very pro type systems. And I think part of the reason stems from this, right? The compiler is stopping you from shooting yourself in the foot, right? By telling the compiler that, hey, i is an integer and a is an array of integers, you know that, hey, this array access is good. This index is an integer, which is good. And it would say, hey, this is bad, though. You can't assign a string into an array of integers. Right? This is the type system doing its job to protect. It's like a beautiful straitjacket right? to stop you from harming yourself. You just hope you can do other things with this straitjacket on. So do you need to? Specify exactly the types of all variables in all in all the programs you write in C or in Java. All the variables? No. What was that? Did you say all the variables? Mm hmm no. All variables. Yep. No. No? Give me an example. C eleven you can use the auto keyword. Yeah, it's cheating. <laughs> C eleven you can use the auto keyword. Explain to me exactly what it does. Figures no, it just it figures it out, yes. <laughs> It's not quite exact enough. <laughs> but for usage is good, yes. For C sharp, you can use uh, the var keyword. So C sharp has the var keyword, which C sharp actually has two, if I remember. There's var, which I believe is the same as auto, which will figure it out. There's also another one that's like a dynamic keyword that it actually doesn't figure it out statically. It's used in like the returns of link calls, but I cannot remember what it is. If somebody remembers, let me know. I think Swift does some similar with the var, because you in Swift I don't think you can you don't need to, to say a type, just infer. But you can, but you can also inference at the end of it as long as it's Cool. So then it may be using something like this. So Swift is the uh, what is it? That's Objective C replacement basically on is it just iOS? No. Is it's it iOS and this 
any, it's mostly iOS yeah, sensor devices, usually the Objective-C, they just don't want to stay with the Mac. So. Right, okay, cool. So, but the idea is to get to think about what about parameterized types? Right? Have you done writing classes in Java with generics or templates with C++? Yep. So there you're kind, of, you're kind of not really specifying the exact type of a variable. Right? You're saying that this variable can have some type T and that the person who calls this function will tell you exactly what that type of T is. Right? So in some languages, so the idea is now instead of right, you saying this function only operates on these types, you allow the person calling your method to give you the types. Right? So generics, it's called generics in Java or C sharp, templates in C. You've all seen this, right? No? Okay. It's not a lot of hand raising. Nodding is fine. Okay. Cool. Right? So what does this look like? So in Java, we can make some class called the chooser class. It can have some random thing. And so here it has some generic function. We call it a generic function, right? So it's a function. So the parameter is some type t, right? So in addition to the normal parameters to this method, there's an additional type parameter of t. And so we're saying this function choose. I'm not saying as the programmer who wrote this function, if it takes in integers or strings or whatever, what I'm saying is as long as you give me two types that are the same, I will return a type of that same type. So if you give me two integers, I will return an int. If you give me two strings, can you call this function by passing in a string and an integer? No. No, because you can only pass in one type parameter, this capital T. Right? That's how you know I am specifying a constraint that these are the exact same type. So what does this thing do? Well, it's a very generic method to randomly choose between one of these two, either first or second. So we can see we're getting the next int from our random number generator and saying if it's mod 2 is 0, so if it's an even number, return first. If it's an odd number, return second. So what's the benefit of writing this function like this? You don't have to write that for every type. Yeah, I don't, if I couldn't parameterize the types, I would have to write this for every single type, or I'd have to use some crazy, horrible C hack and use void types here. And then I could do that, right? But then I miss this benefit that these two types have to be exactly the same. Right? And then it returns the same type. So if I were to, let's say, return a void star and take in two void stars, the person who called my function would have to make sure to cast the result to whatever they expect it to be. It would also, the burden would be on them to make sure they passed in two types that were the same type. Right? But here, now the type system can check this. And the type system can say, oh, you're calling this choose function. You're passing in two integers. That means the return type is an integer. And it makes sure that both first and second are integers. So you can think about this actually raises the level of, of abstraction up. Right? Now we can talk about not just parameters to functions. We can talk about parameters to functions and types as parameters to functions. And let the person who's calling our function tell us the types. It's a very powerful idea. So how is this used? So we can have some class. We can have, of course, our magic main method. And here we can set an int Oh, we can have an int x and an int y, and we can print out chooser.choose x or y. Will we know which number it's going to output? No, it could be either of them. We can have string a is foo, string b is bar, and then we can output chooser.choose a or b. Right? Because the key is the functionality of the choose method does the choose method doesn't care about what its types are. Right? It's not trying to perform addition on first or second, which would mean that they had to be integers. Right? It's saying that this function is abstract and generic enough that it can be applied to any types as long as those types are the same. Cool. What? Yes? Uh, in Java, I think you can force the type to be comparable. Like yes. Like make sure that T implements or extends comparable or whatever. Is there an equivalent to that in C++? 
I don't remember. I don't know. Anybody familiar with C++ enough to know if you can specify that the types have to be sub subtypes? Uh, yeah, I don't. I can't remember exactly the semantics of how you do that in Java. I don't know if you can specify. You can so you can specify constraints on T and say T has to be some subtype of this or has to implement I comparable or something. Yeah, I'm sure the same thing exists in C++. And if not, then you get around that with subclasses, right, or interfaces. So you take in an I comparable first and an I comparable second, and that's what you use. But that's also tricky because you're not saying they're exactly the same type that is also comparable, so, yeah. Cool. So questions about this? You're all familiar on this? Cool. So this is relating the stuff we're going to do to a language that you're familiar with and that you've used before. Um, so we think this is great. We've come to the promised land, right, in some sense. We don't have to specify types in this chooser function, right? But is that true? What did we as the... What did we as the programmer have to say? What choices did we make when we were writing this choose function? Type-wise. Parameter must be on the same thing. Yeah, so A, I had to declare it as generic, right? I had to say this is a generic function. I had to probably, well, if you're me, I had to look up the syntax for how to do generics in Java so I could do the right syntax here. Right? But you figure it out, you do the brackets, you say type T, right? And then I have to, even though I'm being generic, I have to specifically say the return type is T, the first parameter is of type T, and the second parameter is type T. So I have to tell the compiler that these two types must be the same, right? So even though I'm getting some level of abstraction here, I still have to explicitly state the types even in my generic function. And so we're going to look at, so um, what we're going to look at is a form of, so here we have what's called explicit polymorphism, where uh, we had to specifically say that these two types, and polymorphism here is an overloaded term, right? Because we're very familiar with object-oriented programming and polymorphism, right? Here we're thinking about it in types, right? That type T, I can call this function with any type T, but even though I can do that, I still had to be explicit about where those type, that type T appeared in the function. Right? And so this way the compiler can check that when you invoke this function, are you doing it correctly according to the signature. The flip side of this, and I would argue something that gives you even more uh, expressibility, is what we're going to study in that, hey, let's make the compiler do that work. Right? If we look at this chooser function, if I didn't specify any types here of what choose returned or took in, could the compiler actually figure out that A, it doesn't matter what type I pass in so that it's a generic function, and could it determine that both true, both first and true had to have the same type, and that it returned that same type? Yes, that's what we're going to study. So yes, it's possible. But the question is understanding and maybe believing me for a little bit about that. That's actually, in my mind, a cooler way to program than like this. Right? Yeah. So when you, when you call the function, now you have to like, put the angle bracket and then the next time? Do I have to do it here? Yeah. Well, I'm asking you, do I have to do it here? That's what I did when I used it. <laughs> So you have to, in Java, you have to specifically specify when you see, when you hear you're calling, if, I think in an older version, you always had to include it. In newer versions, if it can tell based on the types of the parameters here, which exact, what your exact T parameter is, then you don't have to specify. The problem, I think, when you get into, I think the problem you can get into is if you have, like, two things that are subclasses of the same superclass and it's not clear what exactly you're passing in, right? Then you get into weird issues where you have to explicitly specify. Um, but the idea is, man, wouldn't it be really cool if we could get the type safety that we want, 
right, that we already established we want without actually specifying any of the types in the program. Right? The idea is if I knocked off this int here, int here, string, string, knocked off these t's here, could the compiler actually figure out, yes, here I'm calling chooser.choose .choose with ints, and here I'm calling chooser.choose .choose with strings, and that successfully type checks. Cool. So that is a form of implicit polymorphism. So instead of being explicit about the types, right, and even explicit about the generic types that we're talking about, can we do this implicitly? And so that now you, the programmer, don't have to worry about, well, you don't have to worry about specifying all the types, but you have to worry about your program type checking, right? If the compiler can't type check your program, your program's not valid. So dynamic languages have this property too, right? So anybody do Python or JavaScript or Ruby or one of these dynamic languages? Do you need to specify types in that language? No. You don't even need to declare variables often. They'll just pop into existence. Right? But how do you know when you're writing one of those languages whether you, you made a type error? An error occurs before you run it or while you run it? While you're running it, because it does not type check everything beforehand. It is doing type checking, right? As it executes, it's like, ah, you tried to call some weird method on an integer that should be a string, right? So it is doing type checking at runtime, but you don't know beforehand whether your program type checks or not. So with implicit polymorphism and what we're going to study and look at is the type checker can actually statically attempt to assign the most general type to every single construct in the program. So every function, every parameter, every variable will have a type in this program, and it will be the most general type possible while still satisfying the type constraints, or you'll get a type checking error. This is actually really cool. And so we're not going to, um, I just had an idea. I mean, I'm not going to do it, but it would be fun to make you program in a language that did this while you're learning this. Um, Something, so if you want to dig into this more, uh, Haskell is a really good language for this. Um, I believe F Sharp will do this too, as will any of the ML family of languages. OCaml is one that's uh, used very heavily. Uh, it's actually kind of crazy, because um, I did a project, like a static analysis tool in OCaml, and I didn't know it at all, but over time you get to the point where you feel like you're fighting with the type system because it's not doing things. And then when the types all fall into place, your program actually works. Like, it's weird. Like, there's, I don't know, the type system is so good that when your program type checks, it's likely to be correct. Whereas now, your program type checks and just pray that everything works right. Cool. So let's dig into this. So, what's the idea here? So we're also going to use slightly different syntax here that's lifted from kind of the OCaml ML style of languages. So here I'm defining a function foo which takes in a parameter x and what does it return? x. So no explicit return statements just whatever you can think that statements kind of return themselves. So I have a function foo x so what's the type of foo? So let's think about, about this and discuss this. What is the type? What do you think the type of foo is? What is the most general type that you as a human could assign to foo? Object. Is foo an object? <coughs> think about our type constructor rules, right? What is foo? A function, right? So its type should be a function. So then what do functions need for their types? Parameters and return. Parameter types and return type, right? So 
So what is the, okay, so how many parameters does it take in? So it takes in one and returns something. And in this language, we'll say we can't return more than one thing. We'll keep just one thing, right? So here we have, it takes in one thing and returns one thing. So what would be the most general type that can do that? So if I had, so we're saying foo, we know it's a function. It takes in something and returns something. Right? So what would be the most generic thing you could take in and return? Function. A function? Like this? As a parameter? An integer? What's more general than an integer and can an integer hold a function? Variable. Let's just call it any type. Well, let's go with the other example, t. Right? Any type t. It could be a function, could be a pointer to a function, could be a pointer to a structure, that structure contains whatever. Right? Most general would be just like we saw in the generic example. We'll just represent it as, let's say, t. So then what could be the most generic type that foo could return? Not that function foo, but in general. Is that S. S? Why is that more general? It's a different type. A different, a completely different type, right? So here we're saying there's absolutely no relation between what it brings in and what it returns. But we had this function foo, right? So what is then the type? So this would be general. So this would be like the most general one parameter function you could write. So now if we have a function foo, this function foo, specific function, we know what's the overall type? X. Function. We know that foo is a function because it's defined as a function. And so it's a function, how many parameters does it take in? One. So then what is the most general constraint the most general thing we can come up for with this parameter x, based on this usage here? T. T? And what about the return type? It has to be T, right? Is this more or less general than this function? Less general, right? We added a constraint that says the output type is the same as the input type. And then, so if I had another function bar, this is more or less general than foo. Less, it's more specific, right? You can't call bar with, by passing in a structure, right? You can only call it by passing in an integer. Cool, sweet. Okay, so in our old syntax that we used in the last section, we would say function of t returns t. What we're going to be use, using to be more consistent with the traditional style of function types is we're going to use this style, which I was using there. Right? So here this means a function. So this whole thing means a function. Right? So this means it's a function that takes in one parameter, that first type of that parameter is t, and it returns something of type t. Cool? Just a little syntax variation, but this will help you if you do decide to go and pick up and try to learn some of these languages, you won't like freak out when you see the output of the type because it looks exactly like this. Cool. So now I can have a f two functions, right? A function foo, which is the same. A function bar, which takes in a y and returns foo of y. So what would be the most general types I could assign to foo and to bar? So what about foo? A function with takes in t and returns t? What about bar? Function 
function which takes in t and returns s? Okay, so foo is the same, right? Foo didn't change, it makes sense, the type doesn't change. So, what does the fact that we're using y, which is the parameter to bar, as the argument to foo, does that constrain the possible types of y? Yeah, it just keeps it same. Does it? Does this mean that y has to be an integer? Does it mean that it has to be a structure? Or a pointer? What do you mean the same type as x? So what's happening with the return of foo y? Just like with x, it's going to be returned from bar. Right? So from the type system, if we know the type of foo, right, we say we pass in some type t, and then we get back the same type t, so then what would bar bar's type look like? Similar thing, right? A function that takes in a t and returns a t. Now, the important question is, are these the same t's? Got your yeses and noes. Think about it like this, that's a good question. What if, so what if later on in my code I put bar 10 and then foo hello? Could I do this? Probably. Are the t's the same? Does this even make sense to talk about the t's being the same? When, when do we care about that the, so there's two things here, right? We have foo and we have bar, right? So what we're saying here is we want to invoke bar and now this type t will be, ten, will be an integer, right? When we invoke it. And then when foo gets invoked, it knows that it's going to invoke integer. integer of bar, right? The parameter, type parameter that's passing a foo is going to be integer. But here with foo, now I can invoke foo with a string, and this time it's invoking it as a string, so it's returning a string. Yes. Right? So it's important to think that the t only matters inside its own function definition. This is a completely valid right, alternative type for bar. Because when we're looking at the type of a single function, we only care about parameters that it gets passed in and the return type. Whatever it calls helps us figure out what the return type is. right? The fact that bar calls foo means that the return type of bar must be the same as the input parameter. That's the constraint that it adds. We don't care that this is called, we call this t or w or y or z. All we care is this is a function that takes in some type t, and whatever type it takes in is the same type that it returns. Cool. Sweet. So now we can do cool things. We can write functions like, any, anybody ever write a function like this, which is the Biggest number, maximum, right? So give me two numbers or two anythings. 
If x is less than y, then return y. Otherwise, return x. Right? Remember, no explicit return statements here. It's going to be the statement here is going to be returned. Good. Yeah. Well, if that goes back to the question I had earlier. You have to guarantee that both x and y are of comparable types. Yes. And ideally, they would be of the same comparable types. So you're not comparing against the string. Yes. So we'll see that in a second. Cool. So what would be the type of max? So what is the overall type of max? A function. Definitely a function. How many parameters does it take in? Two. And it returns one type. Boom. I mean, that's you got the basic structure down there. So from looking at this, what do we know is true? What does it depend on? Going back to that question. When trying to figure out what's the most general type of x and y, what does that depend on? So let's think about it just without even thinking about this comparison operator here. Can x and y be different types? Yes? Yes. Why? It's kind of like it needs to flow by the yeah, this base level though it needs to be at the, the most generic level at the same time. So could they be instant strings? Yes. Maybe your language comes with length of the string and compare with Cool, that's why we're ignoring the comparison here. So but then so if you say that x and y can be different types, so you can have an int and a string, then what is the return type of the function max? Integer or string. What kind of type is integer or string? <laughs> type of y or type of x. Right, so actually now we're exploring different types of type systems that actually kind of can allow that. Um, I did not think we'd get there. Uh, so, so let's think about this. So assuming we don't have a types to represent, we can't describe ors in our type system, right? We cannot define a variable x that is either an int or a string, which is Kind of tricky, right? How would you say that a variable x can be either an int or a string? Right? So if we can't have that, then can we have x and y be either an integer or a string? Why or why not? Yeah. Well, I, I just had an idea. We could favor one, so we just assume that whatever they're trying to compare is of type x, and then when we do the comparison, we'll cast y as the type of x. Cool. And then and then return. So but then not so back. not the comparison though not the comparison or the uh, well we still I guess if if the comparison operator is defined but either way we'll just if we're going to return y before we return it we'll cast it as type so why would you have to cast it though I have no idea so that I have to, I, so that when I call the function I know what I'm going to get back yes so when you call the function you know what type you're going to get back right you don't want to call a function and say ah it's going to return either an int or a string <laughs> Hope you're prepared for both. <laughs> I, I mean, I guess you could make a type system do that, then you get into really weird stuff. So there's two things here. A, x and y need to be comparable, right? They need to be, it depends specifically on our less than operator, how that's defined. Let's say the less than operator will work on any basic types. So they just have to be the same, right? They have to be the same basic type. You can't compare two different types that aren't the same. So, because of that comparison, we know x and y have to be the same type. And because of this branch, in one branch of the if statement, we return y. In the other branch, we return x. Those better be the same types, right? Because otherwise, we have a program that now we, we don't know the type that it's going to return. It depends on the runtime path, which would be a horrible way to program, right? So, oh, this would be if it just returns it. Uh, I'm not going to worry about that. Cool. Okay, so uh, we're out of time. All right, we're gonna finish this up on Friday. I was actually a lot here. All right.